Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar and question lab this evening. Tonight's topic, as you probably already know, is microbiology and specifically parasites. Leading our discussion today is the one and only Dr. Boris Vicaria, and he's going to introduce himself now. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Paris. I'm a dermatology resident uh, here in Dallas, Texas. I originally graduated from pharmacy school in Missouri and then went back home to uh, Michigan and do medical school. Um, I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX, so I work one-on-one -on -one with students to help prepare them for the USMLE RX. Um, sorry, the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. Um, and I'm happy to help lead tonight's session on parasites. As you can see, the answer choices are covered up, and that is by design. We don't want you to see any answer choices that you may be uncomfortable with or unfamiliar with that may cause you to panic. And we also don't want the answer choices to guide or dictate your thought process. So I've gone ahead and removed those for you. After that, we will read the lead in or the last sentence, which is the question itself. And we do that so that when you read the vignette, you already know what the test writer is asking. So you can pick up on all of those relevant clues and prevent yourself from having to reread that question and waste valuable time on test day. So let's go ahead and read that vignette now. Which of the following is the vector for the transmission of this patient's most likely illness? Which of the following is the vector for the transmission of this patient's most likely illness? Once we read the lead-in, we'd like to ask our students how many steps they believe this question will require. And we do that so you can keep an organized thought process and not make any careless mistakes and also to ensure that you answer the right question. An example of a one-step question could be where you're asked for the diagnosis. An example of a two-step question could be where you're asked for the treatment for a diagnosis. And an example of a three-step question could be where you're asked for the mechanism of action for a treatment for a diagnosis. So with that, I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll move on and read that vignette. All right, I see the responses coming in, so let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 47-year-old woman presents to the clinic with fever, chills, weight loss, and skin discoloration over the past four weeks. Her symptoms started about two months ago after she returned from a trip to North Africa. Her temperature is 36.5 degrees Celsius or 97.7 Fahrenheit. Physical examination, Reveals grayish skin, hepatomegaly, massive splenomegaly, and edema. Laboratory tests indicate moderate anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Results of a bone marrow aspirate are shown below. I'll give you a few moments here, or a few seconds rather, to look at that picture. Which of the following is the vector for the transmission of this patient's most likely illness. And with that, I'll hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So what we are going to do is we are going to show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. So starting off with any question, you know, they generally are going to give you demographics. And in this case, uh, we're told this is a 47-year-old woman, okay? So important to make note of that. That'll automatically uh, help guide you in you know, what's going on, uh, what should be on your differential diagnosis. Then usually they tell you why they're there. So in this case, fever, chills, weight loss, and skin discoloration, okay? So important to make note of why are they coming there? What's the main issue that brought them in? Um, and then often they'll also tell you how long it's been going on for. So that'll give you a clue is into chronicity. Is it acute? Is it chronic? Okay. In this case, they also gave us some other time frame history. They gave us some social history. Anytime they tell you about a trip somewhere, always ask yourself, why are they telling me about this trip? Why are they telling me about this vacation? So important to make note of that. Um, and then they give us obviously physical exam findings, lab findings, um, important to make note of that as I'm sure you all are aware, okay? So then they give us a bone marrow aspirate finding below. Okay, we'll talk about that eventually. But they're asking us about um, what is the vector for transmission of the most likely illness. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've got to figure out what is that most likely illness that this patient has. And then based off that, the second step would be to know the vector for that condition. 
okay? The vector that allows for transmission of that condition. So probably a two-step question here. So we're gonna go ahead and now we're gonna uncover those answer choices, okay? We're gonna take a look at those answer choices. You see five answer choices there. And what we recommend to students that we work with is that you start at the bottom and that, and then work your way up to the top. So start at answer choice E in this case and work your way up to A. And the reason we recommend that is because a lot of times we'll see students who, you know, they'll start at the top right after reading that lead in, they'll see something they like and they'll select it. And sometimes they'll get it wrong because they never went through all the answer choices. So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from biasing yourselves and to not make that mistake. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Answer choice E, Sandfly, D, Reduvid Bug, C, Ixodes Tick, B, Anopheles Mosquito, and A, Aedes Mosquito. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Boris. The poll is open. We're going to wait until about two thirds of you have responded. And then we will go over the correct and incorrect answer choices. As always, we do have a raffle at the end of the evening. So make sure you stick around. You could be our lucky winner, but you must be present to win. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. The clear favorite here was Sandfly with 43%. And in second and third place was pretty close, the Anopheles mosquito and the Aedes mosquito. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is E, Sandfly. And 43% of you got it right. Let me hand it off to Paro so he can explain to us why that is the correct answer. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, guys. This is a nice parasite question. So this patient, as many of you guys probably have, uh, have uh, gotten, has leishmaniasis, visceral leishmaniasis, okay? It's an infection with the parasite leish, Leishmania uh, donovini, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Sean has gone ahead and pulled up a table from first aid looking at leishmaniasis, okay? And you can see there, that it's an infection, and specifically the visceral type, is an infection with le leishman, uh, leishmaniasis. And visceral leishmaniasis, which is also referred to as Kala Azar, you can see spiking fevers, hepatosplenomegaly, and pancytopenia. Okay. There's also cutaneous leishmaniasis, which I've actually been able to see a few times, um, but visceral leish leishmaniasis is what's being talked about here. And you can see there in that the mode of transmission is via the sand fly, okay? So let's go back and take a look at our question. And now that we've reviewed this table, hopefully it will make sense when we look at those clues that we highlighted. So we can see there that this patient has hepatosplenomegaly. They told us about hepatomegaly, massive splenomegaly, also has pancytopenia, low RBCs, white blood cells, and or neutrophils specifically in this case, and low platelets, okay? Now they also, it used to be called Kala Azar, or black disease, black fever, because there used to be, or sorry, there, there can be grayish, darkish discoloration of the skin, usually of the hands and arms, okay? So that's what they're referring to with that skin discoloration. And usually this is something seen in North Africa, um, also Middle East, Central Asia as well. And it occurs, um, if you were to have cutaneous lesions, those would occur on exposed skin at the site of where you were bit by the sand fly. Okay, so the, the vector here is the sand fly. So great job here, okay? And what we're seeing on this bone marrow aspirate is we are seeing macrophages with a lot of intracytoplasmic bugs or parasites, what are called the mastigotes, okay? So you can see there the big cells with those tiny little purplish, purplish globules within them. Those are the mastigotes of this infection, okay? So this would also be in the differential of your parasitized histiocytes, your parasitized macrophages. So macrophages 
that have uh, intracellular path uh, uh, parasites. So histoplasmosis is another common one as well. Okay. So great job on this question. Let's take a look at the other answer choices, why those are incorrect. Answer choice D, that is getting at Chagas disease spread by trypanosoma cruzii. Okay. Um, that's a condition characterized by cardiomegaly, sometimes dilation of the intestinal tract. Not what we're seeing here. Answer choice E, uh, the Ixodes tick actually transmits a few pathogens, okay? Um, Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi, babesiosis by Babesia microtii, and anaplasmosis. So a few things for Ixodes tick, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and Lyme disease, okay? They don't usually present with uh, these specific signs and symptoms, especially the skin discoloration. Um, and you wouldn't see the pathogen on bone marrow aspiration. Uh, answer choice B, uh, this transmits um, the plasmodium species of malaria. Okay, so you can see anemia, you can also see fever, but you should also see uh, some other clues getting at malaria. So cyclical fevers, um, sweating, um, and you should, this is something you would see on a smear of red blood cells, not a bone marrow aspiration. Lastly, the Aedes mosquito, that spreads primarily your flabby viruses, so dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika, um, which uh, also present differently than this patient. So uh, hopefully a nice review of some of those other vectors there as well, and great job on this question. Excellent, thank you, Paros. Yes, great job, everyone. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move on now to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices have been removed. That is by design. And we will begin, as always, with the lead-in. The most likely infecting organism invades the host's immune system through which of the following cells? The most likely infecting organism invades the host's immune system through which of the following cells? I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you think this question will require. Then we'll move on to the lead-in. All right. You've had some time now, so let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 21-year-old female presents to the clinic because of two-day fever abdominal pain, and bloody diarrhea. The patient recently returned from Peru. A few days before coming home, the patient ate chicken skewers with rice sold by a street vendor. Temperature is 38.5 degrees Celsius or 101.3 Fahrenheit. Physical examination reveals that the abdomen is diffusely tender to deep palpation, but is negative for rebound tenderness. A stool sample is positive for a non-motile gram-negative bacterium. The most likely infecting organism invades the host's immune system through which of the following cells? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead-in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are gonna show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead-in, okay? So now we have a little bit of a younger patient, a 21-year-old female. Why was she coming to the clinic? Well, she's having fever, abdominal pain, and bloody diarrhea. How long has it been going on for? They told us two days, okay? In this question, she also had some travel history, in this case, Peru, okay? So important to make note of that. They also gave us some very important social history about what she was doing in Peru, okay? They're giving you that for a reason, at least for you to make note, okay? So it's important to make note um, of, you know, what were their potential ingestions or exposures, okay? In this case, they give us some further physical exam findings and are even nice enough to give us some stool sample findings, okay? So obviously, you definitely want to make note of that because that's really going to help you figure out what is going on in this patient if this is an infection. So they are then asking us 
about the most likely infecting organism, okay? And how does it invade the host's immune system? Specifically, through what type of cell, okay? So I think we've got at least two steps here. I think we've got to figure out one, maybe, um, you know, what is the condition that this patient has, okay? Um, I think you could then maybe argue that technically the next step would be the organism involved in that uh, condition. Um, and then three, how does that organism uh, evade the host immune system? So what is the uh, specific cell that it invades? Okay, so I think we have at least two steps and maybe a third step in, in specifically identifying the organism in this condition, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. Once again, we have five answer choices. And once again, I'm gonna start at the bottom. And I'm gonna work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, tuft cells. D, parietal cells. C, panith cells. B, microfold cells. And A, goblet cells. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Paris. As you can see, the poll is open, and once again, we will wait until about two thirds of you have responded. And then as always, we will go over incorrect and correct answer choices, which is something I hope all of you are doing when you do practice questions. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. It was close. 31% of you picked panid cells and 28% of you picked microfold cells. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, microfold cells, and 28% of you got it right. Let me hand it off to Forrest so we can explain to us why. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question. So. Let's take a look at what's going on in this question. So this patient has diffuse abdominal pain, fever, and bloody diarrhea after consuming food purchased from a street vendor, okay? So this patient probably has Shigella or Shigellosis due to Shigella flex neuri. It's a common cause of bloody diarrhea in low income countries, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide sean has gone ahead and pulled up uh, a table from first aid looking at salmonella versus shigella okay so as you can see there at the very top these are gram negative rods and they invade the gi tract through the m cells or the microfold cells of pyrus patches that's what the m stands for okay So you can see there that we now have the answer, but we'll take a quick look. So in Shigella, you can see there that um, it presents often with crampy abdominal pain and patients can and usually do have bloody diarrhea. Okay, this is the column on the very far right, that's Shigella. And on the next slide as well, there's a little bit more information. You can see there about some of the unique properties. So. Uh, fingers, flies, food, feces, all potential ways of getting this infection, okay? And the invasion of M cells or microfold cells is key to pathogenicity, okay? So now that we know that these are M cells, and that's how this infection can man or can invade into the, uh, the immune system. So let's go back to our question, look at the other answer choices why those would be incorrect. Um, answer choice E, tough cells. These are actually chemosensory cells. So they're um, more so for uh, chemical sensation, kind of like taste buds um, in the GI tract. Parietal cells, these are in the GI tract as well, and these secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Um, no real role in host defense against organisms. Answer choice C, panid cells. Um, these are part of the small intestine, 
Um, and their function is to secrete certain substances like lysosomes, defensins, and they do help defend against microorganism invasion. However, the panis cells themselves don't really play a role against the infecting organisms, um, and they're not invaded by this organism or other organisms similarly, okay? And lastly, goblet cells, as you guys probably know, these are cells that secrete mucus into the GI tract. Um, but nothing that would be uh, where you'd worry about a for, uh, organism invading the goblet cells specifically. Okay, so this was a question on um, uh, specifically uh, immunology as well, um, and on top of microbiology. So a lot of overlap between some of those basic sciences here in this question. Excellent, thank you very much. Boris, a great job everyone, that was a tough question. Before we move on now to our third question of the evening, I want to take some time to tell you a little bit about RX Coach. RX Coach is our coaching program. So we work with students uh, all the way from MS1 through graduation and uh, through step two, okay? We work with students who graduated up to 15, 17 years ago, and we work with students who are taking step and, and studying uh, for their block exams as well. If you're studying for a comprehensive exam or a USMLE or commerce exam, we'll start you off with one of our assessments and then base your personalized study plan uh, uh, on, on that baseline that you, that you receive from that assessment. If you're currently in medical school studying for uh, in-class exams, we'll use your syllabus uh, and come up with a personalized study plan of that way. And by working with us, our students always tell us that their study plan made their study more efficient and they got higher grades and they got there in less time than they expected. We've had success stories of students breaking 260 regularly. One of them is now one of our coaches. We've had students that come to us and graduated, like I said, over a decade ago, and they've been successful as well. We have great tutors and coaches, just like you met uh, Boris today and Brian. They're all certified and highly trained. With every tutoring and coaching package, you will receive access to all of our resources, which includes BRICS, our Question Bank QMAX, our Express videos, as well as our flashbacks. So if you're studying and you think that, you know, you could use the advice and guidance of a coach, please reach out to us. We're here to help you. We'd love to make you one of our success stories. And you can do that online at rx-coach or rx-coach.com. You can click on the free consultation tab to talk about the program and how it can benefit you. And we'd love to share with you some of our success stories and talk about how we can help you on your academic journey. So with that, let's go ahead and move on now to our third question of the evening. Please do keep in mind that next week's topic is respiratory physiology, and we do have a raffle and special offer for all of you at the end. So make sure you stick around because you must be present to win. Once again, the answer choices have been removed. That is by design, and we will begin with the lead-in. Which of the following organisms is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? Which of the following organisms is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? I'll give all of you a few moments to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require, and then we'll move on to the vignette. All right, see the response is coming in, so let's go ahead and read that vignette. A five-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department with a four-day history of abdominal pain and diarrhea. Three weeks ago, he traveled to the Philippines and went swimming at his grandparents' lake house. Temperature is 38.4 degrees Celsius or 101.2 Fahrenheit, and physical examination demonstrates tenderness to palpation of the right upper quadrant. The serum alkaline phosphatase is normal, and a complete blood cell count shows elevated eosinophils. Microscopic analysis of a stool sample reveals eggs. Which of the following organisms is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in this vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are gonna show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. So here we have a five-year-old boy in this situation, so a younger patient. Why did he come to the ER? Well, abdominal pain and diarrhea, okay? How long was it going on? Four days. Now, going with the theme here, you can also see that there is some travel history, okay? 
there's some exposures there as well, okay? Specifically swimming at the lake house in the Philippines. They give us some vital signs, physical exam findings. They give us some abnormal uh, by, uh, CBC count findings. And then again, also give us stool sample findings, okay? So a few things there that they're giving us. Important to highlight those, make note of those. Those are all clues that are gonna help us come up with the answer to that lead-in, which is, which organism is the most likely cause? So I think we've got a couple steps here. One, what is the patient's issue? What is the illness? What is the diagnosis? And then two, what is the organism that causes that condition or that illness? So I think we've got a nice solid two-step question here. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. Once again, we've got five answer choices. Okay, I'm gonna start at the bottom and I'm gonna work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, Strongyloides stercoralis. D, Schistosoma japanicum. C, Loa loa. B, Clinorchis sinensis. And A, Ascaris lumbricoides. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Um, Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Paros. The poll is open. We're going to wait once again until about two thirds of you have responded. Don't forget that we do have a raffle at the end and you must be present to win, so make sure you stick around. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments. All right, let's take a look here and see what you selected. And it looks like 41% of you selected Schistosoma japonicum. That was our number one answer. And in second place was answer choice A. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed D. And 41% of you got it right. So great job for those of you who got it right. If you didn't, don't worry. We're here to learn together. And if you did get it right, let's make sure we got it right for the right reason. So let me hand it off once again to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, guys. Great job with this question. So let's take a look at what's going on. This is a patient. Now we have a younger patient who likely has, as you guys picked up on, acute schistosomiasis. Okay. He's got a fever, right upper quadrant pain, diarrhea and he was swimming in fresh water, specifically in an endemic area, East Asia. That's a big clue there, okay? So East Asia swimming in fresh water. They gave us those clues right in the second sentence, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide, and we can see there a little bit more information about schistosoma, okay? So with schistosoma, um, as you can imagine, some signs and symptoms would include fever, myalgias, abdominal cramps, especially in the right upper quadrant, okay? And what you would wanna see is you would wanna see eggs on a stool sample, okay? And there's an example there in, in the, that picture A, okay? And classically, a lot of these schistosoma um, eggs will have a little bit of a spine, okay? The spine can be either lateral, it can be either um, terminal, um, but that spine can really clue you in to the diagnosis if you were to see that image on a question. Okay, so keep that in mind. That spine can often help you with diagnosing schistosoma. Okay, so how does this gut organism work? Um, well, there's a few types of schistosoma bugs, as you can see there. There's Japanicum, which you would see in East Asia. There's Mansoni, which is more in Africa or South America. Um, and then you can see there also schistosoma, schistosoma hematobium, which can lead to uh, painless hematuria. So that's your classic question. Uh, and then also potentially risk for squamous cell cancer of the bladder. Okay. So you guys did a great job on picking up uh, that this was um, um, freshwater exposure. You can see there in the transmission uh, that it talks about penetration of skin of humans who are swimming or bathing in contaminated fresh water, OK? 
okay? And that's in that transmission column on the right. So great job with this question. Let's take a look at the other answer choices in case you selected those, and why those would be incorrect. Answer choice E. So this causes strongyloides, and what happens is that larvae penetrate into the skin from soil, okay? And so you can get irritation at that site of skin penetration, and then you'll also have maybe pulmonary and GI symptoms, okay? We don't really have any cutaneous findings here, so this is probably not the best answer. Loa loa, um, this causes loiasis, okay? And it's from the bite, the chrysops fly, a bite of the chrysops fly. Um, what you can see is you can see localized swelling of the face and extremities and eye issues, which we're not seeing here. Answer choice B, this is also known as the Chinese liver fluke, okay? And uh, you can get it by eating undercooked or raw freshwater fish, okay? Patients can also present with right upper quadrant pain and diarrhea, okay? And that would also uh, potentially maybe be concerning in this patient. Um, but you should see an elevated alkaline phosphatase. And that's why they specifically told us in this question that it was normal. So that's why it's also important to sometimes highlight normal findings as well, okay? It, they specifically went out of their way to tell us that the alkaline phosphatase was normal. So it's important to be like, hmm, maybe that's important. And in this case, you can see that helped rule out answer choice B. Lastly, answer choice A. This is an intestinal roundworm that causes ascariasis. A lot of the times, most patients are asymptomatic, but it can also migrate through the lungs and cause some pulmonary symptoms. It can also migrate in, into the GI tract and cause some GI issues, but, but not as likely given the past medical history and, and travel history that we're told about. So the best answer would be D here, which you guys picked up on very nicely. And we'll head on to that fourth question. Excellent. Great job, everyone, especially you, Boris. I don't know how you pronounced all those names without skipping a beat. Well done. Let's go ahead and move on now to our fourth question of the evening. And let's try to finish strong. Once again, the answer choices have been removed, and we will begin with the lead-in. Which of the following best describes the causal agent? Which of the following best describes the causal agent? I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll go ahead and move on to the vignette. All right, I see some responses coming in. Let's go ahead and read that vignette. A 26-year-old male presents to the clinic because of a three-month history of right upper quadrant pain. The patient denies recent fever, vomiting, or diarrhea. He previously worked on a sheep farm in South, Africa, uh, South America. His temperature is 37.8 Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Abdominal ultrasound reveals a well-circumscribed 6-centimeter hypoechoic mass in the left lobe of the liver. Laboratory tests are as follows. White blood cell count of 9,000, segmented neutrophils 56%, band forms 4%, eosinophils 10%, basophils 0.6%, lymphocytes 26%, monocytes 3%. Which of the following best describes the causal agent? And with that, I'll hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. <clears throat> and so we've done this four times now. And so hopefully, you know, you guys are starting to see what we think are important clues as you're going through that vignette. So what you should highlight, what you should take note of. And as Sean mentioned, you know, today for today's purposes, you know, we're not really pausing too long after each sentence, but it is important to, to take note and, and kind of think and add each step and each sentence into your thought process, okay? So we'll go ahead and do that again here. This is a 26-year-old male. He comes to the clinic because of right upper quadrant pain. How long has it been going on for? Three months, so a little bit more chronic than our previous three patients, okay? 
again, they give us some important negative findings, okay? So these are pertinent negatives. So a lot of times when you're asking your patients questions, it's important to say, well, this patient doesn't have a fever, this patient does have a fever, this case doesn't have fever, vomiting, or diarrhea. So we're gonna make note of that. They then told us that he worked on a sheep farm in South America, so another environmental exposure there, okay? They give us some lab findings, some vital signs, some abdominal ultrasound images, uh, or sorry, findings, which are also important to make note of in this question. So they're then asking us about uh, what best describes the causal agent. So I think we've got a few steps here. One, I think we've got to come up with a diagnosis. So let's use those clues that they gave us to come up with a diagnosis. Then once we do that, we're going to come up with what we think is the causal agent in that condition. So that's step number two. And I think there might even be a third step here. They're asking us to what best describes the causal agent. So they may, they may just list the causal agent or sometimes they could give you an extra step and give you something about describing the causal agent. So sometimes, as you guys know, with like viral questions, they'll ask you, is a single, single strand negative, uh, negative sense, um, envelope, non-envelope, so additional step here maybe. So let's take a look at these answer choices. So there is a third extra step here, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and look at those answer choices. We're gonna start at the bottom and we're gonna work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, non-motile gram-negative bacteria. D, flagellates. C, insisted tapeworm. B, amoebae and A, aerobic gram-negative bacteria. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that, uh, that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Farah. So the poll is open. This is our last question of the evening. Let's try to finish strong. Once again, we do have a special offer and a raffle at the end. You must be present to win, so make sure you stick around. And next week's topic will be respiratory physiology. All right, I see the responses coming in. We're gonna wait a few more seconds here. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. It looks like 54% of you selected C insisted tapeworm, and in distant second place was answer choice B. Let's take a look and see what the correct answer is, and the correct answer is C, and 54% of you got it right. Our strongest performance of the evening, so great job, everyone. Let me hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, way to end strong. So um, let's talk about what, go what is going on in this patient, okay? So we could see there, um, that this is a 26 year old male who's got fever and then importantly elevated eosinophils on that differential of the uh, uh, white blood cell count. Okay, so this patient, along with the chronic pain and the ultrasound findings, <clears throat> really should clue you into uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a hydatid cyst. So let's take a look at the next slide, and Sean has gone ahead and pulled up. Um, a very important slide from first aid, looking at this infection. So this is an infection caused by echinococcus granulosis, okay, also known as hydatid cysts. Okay, and you can see that kind of cyst, and that's what it would, it would look like if you were to remove it from the liver, okay? So sometimes those cyst can ruptures and it can, it can lead to anaphylaxis or anaphylaxis-like reactions, okay? You can see there, very importantly in this question, sheep are an intermediate host. Okay, so this patient definitely had a nice environmental exposure. And then you can see there also in that, ultra, that um, I think what looks like a CT scan image, you can see there some of those cystic spaces in an enlarged liver, okay? So that is what it would look like on imaging as well. So let's go back to our question. So hopefully you guys were able to pick up on the steps here and that this was getting at echinococcus granulosis infection. 
which is an, uh, an insisted tapeworm, okay? So let's talk about the other answer choices, maybe why those are incorrect here. So answer choice E, this would be getting at something like Shigella, okay? Shigella could maybe also cause liver abscesses as well, um, but wouldn't usually have other findings like um, uh, Flagellates, that would be something with uh, Giardia or Trichomonas, and that would also manifest with diarrhea. Now, this patient importantly told us he was not having diarrhea. Uh, answer choice B or amoebae, this would be Enta amoeba histolytica, okay? And that can also cause hepatic abscesses. Um, but you would not really see eosinophilia, and this would be for more endemic areas for that. Um, and then also we have a nice risk factor here of working on a sheep farm. Lastly, answer choice A, this could be a few things. Um, one thing could maybe be pseudomonas, which would also cause liver abscesses, but again, wouldn't, shouldn't see eosinophilia per se. So great job on this question, way to end strong, and I will hand it back to you, Sean.